sometimes we think we're so alone. And what I hear in your resiliency is that there were periods where you were alone, but you do have to be able to be by yourself. And I think that's where the solitude, when you're all alone, you say, what do I do? What do I do with myself? I am by myself. And so I remember my grandma used to say that, is that how to be out there by yourself, and you have to do it through the trauma. But in the old days, they did that too. They would go off by themselves and wander through the cricks and the, yeah, the hills, and they would sit with Creator. And so now we, when you get into recovery, uh, remember to do that. Remember to visit with Creator. Because uh, we can have that first-hand audience with creation. And as I get older, the other thing that I want to mention for the younger women, the older women probably understand this, but when I was young, I used to, I realized now that there were times in the universe where there were connections and I didn't listen. Like things were happening for a reason, or somebody walked in, or there was a strange incident, and nowadays I really listen to that because there is something happening. I just um, got a call early this morning, somebody called and said, I heard you talk in Pierce, South Dakota, and I really wanted to know if I could visit with you. And, and she said, where are you? And I said, I'm in Oakland, and she started crying, and she said, my dad is in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And talk about a connection in the universe, it's almost like that. I'm probably going to see her when I get, get back to Sioux Falls when I get back. But those are the kind of things we're much more related than we think in terms of time, space. And uh, the other thing that I heard um, this beautiful young lady say is that you can't st be stingy with healing. Because if you are on that, embarking on that healing journey, and you're all elders to a certain extent, because there's always those teenage girls and those middle school girls, is they're watching. And so when you do get to that healing place, don't be stingy with it. To just, and the way you express it is to not have that hard front, that mean girl look. Because it's just, it's comical really when we begin to realize. And I think that when you leave this room, um, have compassion for all those people that are walking around up here in the city and on the reservations that don't know about this trauma response. Just think about it. They don't realize that nobody sits down and says, oh, this is where, this is why I have red rage. <coughs> so the next time that person exhibits that red rage, if it's a relative that you're angry at, <coughs> they don't know. They're, they absolutely do not understand it, but you can have compassion for them and the way you respond is also going to be a teaching for them. Because obviously, if, you, if you're if you ready to brawl with them, there's not <laughs> there's going to be a standstill there, and it's not going to help anybody. I'm hoping that after the break, we can, I don't know if we're going to be able to get on the internet, but if you haven't seen the hidden messages of water, that, does anybody know about that? Yeah. <laughs> Most of you have, but um, the scientists, or this physicist that is Japanese, he studied the impact of water, and water is holy, it's sacred, and when harsh words were said to water, it breaks up the crystals. I mean, it's just ugly. The word Satan has an effect on that water. Imagine what somebody say, get the hell out of here, F you. Imagine what that does to the water in your body, because two-thirds of our body are water. So you can feel that, and you've all felt that in those violet home settings. So in our generation, like with that little one um, uh, squirming around over there, feeling that mean energy that they're completely full of water. And so in the studies that they did, when they took the water that had been prayed with, had been smudged, beautiful crystalline figures. Yeah. Snowflakes. 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 Snowflakes and frozen water. Mm -hmm. He took cups of water and he put them in the uh, frozen, and that's what they look like. Beautiful, beautiful snowflakes. And so, when you think about the red rage that we've been exposed to, um, it, there's really no choice but to heal. Um, and the biggest thing is that we have choice. But um, I wanted to also say something about domestic violence. Um, if I were to do another extended workshop, I really think that we need to pay attention to attachment. Because we have broken attachments and so the, the personality that you're looking at, that I talked about, the one that doesn't want to say hi to each other, that's really um, a personality of trauma, a trauma personality. 
there's certain characteristics where that individual will exhibit all of these characteristics of their life, and then it'll move into the organization, and then it'll move into the culture. So what we're experiencing in our native world is that attachment, broken personality. And some of those characteristics are avoidance with conflict. Because it's like, I'm going to lose my life if I get into this conflict. It's the original trauma. And I don't even want to settle this because you're not worth it. And so we're right back at that original trauma. Another one is seeing only good or bad. Only seeing black and white. Nothing in between. And life isn't that way. But when we like somebody or we don't like them. No in-betweens. So we have that black and white history. Another one is a uh, real charming personality. You know, we love to laugh as Native people, but sometimes that's superficial, it's calming. It's like, oh, I'm not, you know, I really don't feel that way, I just need to get by. So uh, if you look at a lot of those characteristics, and maybe if I come back at another time, I can go through that, because we have to take our own temperature and say, if I had broken attachment, where did, when did it happen? And how did it affect my life? Because it is going to affect my relationships. The two determiners that are going to decide uh, how you negotiate trauma, and you heard it with these ladies here, is the age, the age that it happened. Uh, so the younger you are that this break occurs, it's going to be a little bit more work because that child's spirit has been left further behind. <coughs> the other determiner, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done. So what you end up with, what I call strong heart girls, is that your heart is really strong to have gotten through these things. The second thing is, and I heard you talking about that from your grandma, is the support. So if you have a little tiny bit of support, you can get through anything. So that's your role as a community, because we have enough problems in the Native community. We don't need to be hating on each other. So the more support that we have, and you all can kind of take a look at each other if you have it met each other before, I think most of you know each other, I really challenge you the next time you see each other to come out of that hardness and greet each other like we did in the old days. And when somebody else sees you doing that, they're going to exemplify that. They're going to carry that on, especially the younger ones, because we, we need to, and it's more than saying how it's sharing that energy and, and that healing. Um, the thing I was going to say about domestic violence, um, what do they say? Who's the domestic violence workers here? What did they say? It takes something like 15 times before they leave a relationship, but it takes that many times to you know, keep going back. And one of the, I heard a story of a girl who is now in the spirit world, but she told me, she said, when I was involved in this relationship for 18 years, I think it was, she said, all of my sisters, I had a whole bunch of sisters, and they would just harangue at me and they'd say, I don't know how you can put up with this. You need to send him packing, or whatever. They go on and on and on. There was one sister that she had, and she would never say that. She would just say, Lori, if when you're when you need me, just call me. You know, if there's ever a time, just call me. That's all she ever said. So the moment that it came in her relationship where they almost she almost got killed, who do you think she called? What? The one who never said anything. Right. So that support can be expressed not necessarily by words, but just be there at that, at that opportune time. And I think that that um, there's power, and that's support, and that's why I tell my story. So there are members of our people in the community that are experiencing that right now. So let them know. Just say if there's a time when you to talk to you. That happened to me with uh, I was uh, working with the tribe in the northwest, and I was. Like and then I had a treatment group, and this girl came up to me, and she said, okay, she said, if I ever leave, I, she said, you better be there. And I said, I will. And so I was working up in my office, and the phone rang, and it was her, and she was talking really quietly, and she said, hey, it's now. It's now. Come get me. And she said, you need to get here now. He's gone for 15 minutes. You need to come. And so I said, where are you? And she said, at the, at the house, at the house. And so I got in my truck and I ran down the hill. And her and the little ones were standing outside the building, outside the front door. They had their, their, their bags and then I hustled them in the car. One of the little ones forgot her teddy bears. We had to frantically run in there and get the little animal and bring them out. But that was the minute. I happened to be at the phone. Just think if I had it. But I happened to be in the office 
when she called that day and then I drove her into the city. So there is an intervention that you never know when you'll be called upon to do. So you know, that's a method of support reaching out to the community. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask the strong heart girls up here? <laughs> comment that uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, it's really been a learning experience for me and the awareness of the people is really righteous. Mm -hmm. You know, that these ladies are, are very strong in their spirit. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to say, if you didn't intervene, she probably would have gone on another 10 years. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Very well. finding time to be with her and to talk to her and say what you just said. Um, when I said that to my mom, I didn't think I was going to do that. But it came to me when I was praying because we were at ceremony together and it came to me that um, she needed me to say that to her. And she has four of us, but I'm the only one that ever said that to her. But I could see her, it, like it was lifted off of her shoulders. What did I do to my kids? What did I not do for my kids? And I told her, I'm the oldest out of all the children. I said, so I have different memories than all those other kids. I said, and I remember, I remember you trying. And I forgive you for everything that you think you did wrong. And I mean, since then, our relationship is a lot closer. And it takes a lot of time. It took me until I was 30 something years old to say that. And if you could do it now, that would be a good thing for the rest of your two relationships. <coughs> and you could have a better one with her and with your children and her. Because mothers carry that. I carry things about my own kids that I wish I would have done differently. But when I put it into perspective, I know that Creator gives us those things for a reason. And that's, you know, what I carry. But I know I did my best. My name is Tanya, and I just want to thank you um, from with all my heart. I have um, a grown daughter, she's 27, and I have two granddaughters for seven and five that um, mean everything to me. I don't have a relationship with my daughter. Um, and so now this has just inspired me to do this healing, everything I've done here, and to, to not give up to have a relationship with her, even though know, she's older than I thought what was the you know. But, um, Thank you very much because now I know that I, I really need to help her to get home. Um, I mean, I thought that from the beginning, and it was, now I really know that it really is important because of the fact that we don't have a relationship, it affects my granddaughters. So thank you very much, Dalton. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that um, one of my 
my kids said to me in regard to what you're talking about, I kept saying, and it's kind of what you're experiencing with your mother, I would say, I'm sorry, I just messed up so bad. And my son said, stop. He said, stop saying that. And he, and he said it with such an urgency. And I said, well, it's true. And he said, it's not. He said, well, every time you tell us that you messed up, it makes me feel that there's something wrong with you. And that got through to me. And he said, there's nothing wrong with me. And I thought, oh my gosh, that was like the light bulb for me. So I thought, ah, I need to quit saying that because he thinks there's something wrong with him if I keep saying it. But that, you know, that's just an idea that you might share because that's, it's re-victimizing. It's living, the, reliving the trauma. I want to say that, like, when you say it's never too late, it literally is never too late. When it was too late at Quicksilver, in 2005, my mother um, suffered a major stroke. And this is my mother who was hospitalized on and off from when I was a little child because she was bipolar. And that's how I became, because she didn't cook for the rest of the family. Now, my mother, for whatever reason, did not like me. The more I tried to do the household cooking and all that, the more anger and animosity I felt from her. And then only later did I realize that she considered me sort of like competition, you know, for the, the role of the mother of the house when she would be home. And um, so it was a very, very um, difficult relationship. A lot of rejection, continuous. And then, you know, she had one child who she said was the perfect child in front of me, in front of all of us. That doesn't really help either. But when she had a stroke in 2005, um, I was in Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, um, even though she was sort of really semi-conscious, you know, she was going in and out of consciousness, and she would only last another nine days. But when I would be in the hospital room, she hear my voice, and they say that the voice really goes permeates the whatever stage you're in. Um, I had the capacity to stay in the hospital room for several hours, which was not the case for my younger sister. So I would come and I'd stay a long time and I'd talk to her and I'd hover around and check on the, the, the care she got. But the weird thing that started happening was that when I would talk to her, she'd start saying, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. And this woman, like, never thanked me for anything. And I love my mom dearly. I did a lot. I turned myself inside out to get her approval and her love. And the more I tried, the more rejection I got. So I thought that that was very mystical, that here she was struggling for her life because the whole left side of the body is paralyzed from head to toe, the whole left side. And uh, the gift that she gave me was in those last, um, hours of real consciousness because she would go on to decline um, and then couldn't talk at all, was just telling me thank you over and over with my name. You know, you're the Paul one for. And so, you know, when she died nine days later, when she, when she got transferred to a rehab center, had a secondary stroke for you. Go on, right? You know, I kept reflecting on what if I hadn't healed enough to stay in that room with her. And you know, be there to hear her say that. Uh, and uh, and it really, he it just did amazing things for me because it was the last thing she could do for me. So when people say it's never too late, I mean, I'm telling you, it really isn't. As long as you still have breath. Yeah, very definitely. Um, the story that I related that I wasn't raised by my mom. When I had red rage, I would say, I don't have a mom. And then when I began to heal. I did have a mother, she just did raise me. And so I would let that go with, with the same thing when she was dying. I was unconscious for quite a while, and then when she started to slide, my oldest sister said, I think it's not gonna be very long. So I rushed back and I went into the, uh, where she was laying in the room, and I was with one of my sisters, and she was completely out. They were draining her lungs, and, and when I walked in, I think it was that great mystery where she was out of her body. And so she must have, Flip back into her body because she started to go <laughs> like that. And then she said, fainty lane, just very like grasping. And she would always call me that. And then she raised her hands 
And she hadn't talked for a long time, but she went, five girls. Because I always worried that I wouldn't be counted as one of the girls. And she went, five girls. And then my sister was saying, it's OK, Mom, we have money. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not what you're saying. She thought she was talking about money. And I said, no, she's saying, five girls, all oh, mine. So that was the message that she gave me. And then shortly after that, she died. So those are powerful, great mystery messages that you know, the power of the Spirit. Goes to show you how the creator kicks down, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do a, a closing session and we'll take a break on um, because mothers are great at being martyrs. And again, when we become a martyr, we do it because of our fear. We don't want our girls to suffer what we've suffered. So we overcompensate and we completely control their lives and then, then we don't know how to say forgive me. So let me have um, somebody play the mother and somebody who can get up. I'm going to have you be the teenager. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can lay on the floor and get up. I want you to lay on your back. Yeah, you're going to be the mom. Put your knees up.
never really been too involved. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, what are you guys doing? Do you want to go to this one? Oh, that's interesting that you're <coughs> doing that exercise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. And so the the whole um, <coughs> goal is to forgive and to know that you have your own power. And part of it is resentment because you would think that when somebody really takes care of you, you would appreciate it. But your spirit is telling you, no, it's oppressive that I can take care of myself. And so it's a natural progression. And that's where the anger comes from. But then if the beginning part, like, oh, we're a teenager, you grow up, you're an adult, you're a mom now, but then it's like, ooh, mommy, I don't know. Yes. Yes. Something that keeps coming up for me, like when uh, young was very shared earlier in, in the history of that, um, and even with the, the journey, the road not there, um, you may be on a different point on the road on your journey, and you know you may change depending what things are being activated. But also the members in your family, you know, they are also on their own journey. Yes. yes. You know. Oh, that's and crazy. So, part. Um, yeah. It's like it can get really deep and thick, and then especially depending on how many of you and what the different traumas are, you know, yeah. you know the leg- I call it a legacy because it's ripples through the generations. But the other thing that I really wanted to share is that um, because my father, he doesn't speak to any of us, you know, um, you may be willing to say, you know, yeah, you did your best, but your parent or your sibling or whatever, whoever that loved one is, they may not be ready, yeah. you know, and they are carrying their own yeah. capitalized trauma that they have blinded, that you did what you showed us in that mm-hmm. exercise, you know, and they're not ready to, you, can, you can't take responsibility. Right, right. To That's it. real important, and at that point, what you did, remember when I took her leg, you have to detach, but there's two ways to detach. You can detach, mm-hmm. pissed off, and angry, and that's not a good detachment, because you're still carrying them. But if you can detach with compassion and say, I have no control over this, and this isn't about me, and I'm going to pray and I'm going to let it go, then you walk away as much as you can with some love, and then just walk away from it. But you're going to have to detach for a while. However, creator comes, and there will be ways, and maybe that never occurs, but you've tried. And when you walk away, just say, I love you. I love you, but I can't stay in this situation. But don't walk away angry and rageful because you're still connected. That actually strengthens the connection. What were you going to say? There's an issue like that I see with youth, um, with parents going through recovery, and that um, a lot of these youth have been parentified, and then once the parent goes through recovery, they take that parentified position away from that child, and then they put them back into being a child, and you do what I say. Yeah and you know pay attention to me i'm the parent yeah. and then there's a lot of resentment from the children because the kids are like i know how to do that already and i've been doing this for years and now you're going to tell me i can or now i have a curfew and now i have rules and before so that's something that i see that that um is hard to deal with especially when the parent relapses and then goes back and then they're re right um, i remember when i was working with this youth when that situation occurred, and he said, gee, I wish mom would get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> because it, like you said, the rigidity, all of that comes in. And I think, again, in any trauma, they need support. So they're gonna have to seek that support outside of that environment. And that's where the kind of work that you're doing helps. Because a lot of times when this is happening, we don't have words or understanding for the dynamic that's going on. And then it's real crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm that type of person. Uh, when I cleaned up, my daughter's 31 now, and I dragged her through my drug addiction and drinking and raised her with her grandma. Then I got clean and she came back with me. Grandma, I couldn't do it. Here goes grandma. Um, then at 14, she made the decision to stay with her grandma. Mommy moved too much. I'm going to stay with grandma because I want to graduate at this school. And I said, okay, that's fine. So we detached in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And then um, I stayed clean, I didn't stay clean. Then I stayed clean for like a couple years and relapsed again. And then I just recently, almost had a year, and we were kind of arguing because I started becoming that parent, I guess, what's this, parentified? 
Right. Fred, if I, yeah, I, I really don't know what that means, but I became that uh, parent, and she was getting mouthy with me, you know, and I, I earned a little bit of respect. I financially took care of her all her life, no matter where she stayed. I was a functioning addict for a while until I hit bottom. And then, um, you know, and I, I just went up to her, I said, look, she goes, she, how do you know how to be a parent? You weren't there for me. And I go, bullshit, I've been there for you the whole time. But my mother was, I started jumping on my mother wasn't there for me. I don't know where that came from. So I was blaming my mom, trying to put my mom down. One of y'all talked about competition with your parent. That's how I feel with my mom because she raised my daughter. Um, I don't like her calling her mom or anything like that. I tried to stop her, but you know now I accept that's her mother also. And it is, you know. But I guess my point is, like this time around, um, I relapsed. I've only had like a barely a week clean. I'm 48 years old, and I, my daughter, I, I went to Reno like maybe about four months ago. And my daughter totally started crying because I was in her life for two years. Now remember, I was in and out of her life. In these two years that I was in her life, I'm going to read them. Get the hell out of here. I need to clean up. She just started crying, and I was like, what's wrong? Because normally I thought she accepted it real easy. Well, this is the first time we bonded so tight because she liked me being that mother and being there for her and my grandkids and all that stuff. So this time I relapse, and I go to re recover. She's so supportive this time around, not angry or mad at me, you know. And um, I can understand where she's, she's excited to come see me this time, last time, no, didn't watch. Don't think I'm gonna come see you right away. Okay, you know, I'm, in my heart, I'm okay. She, I deserve them, she, de she deserves to have resentments. But in my heart, I wanted to uh, bond with her, but I didn't wanna push it. But because of my grandchildren, she's pushing it more. Um, my baby granddaughter is totally fonded to me. Gaga, 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 always up here, and just, she's attached. She forces her mom. I want to see my dog. I want to see her right now. I want to see my dog. She's only three, and my daughter's old. She likes that, mom, because I'm there now. Even though I was under the influence uh, this last time, uh, I stayed out for two years, two and a half. I tried my best to stay normal, and it was, it was a struggle. Um, this time around, I can't believe my daughter's there for me, but I see a whole different uh, bonding. I don't know if it has something to do with my grandchildren, but my mom, we're all kind of connected as three. And um, my mom is like mommy dearest. I, I don't know, I just kind of um, was leaving the house and I can't believe she came up and just started crying. I can't believe these tears coming out of these people that freaking hate me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, they really do care, but I had no heart. So let me share something with you. Um, and again, it's a, a story. Um, children of addicted parents sometimes lose the ability to trust because they've been let down so many times. Mm -hmm. And so I learned this from a 16 year old. His mother had gotten out of prison because she, she couldn't stop drinking and she had gotten like four or five DUIs. <coughs> so she was sent to prison and she came back and she was in a support group. And so um, she was still maintaining the support group and then her friend left and went to Oklahoma or somewhere. So I get a call and this friend is coming back. And so I have this teenager, the child of this mother in my car and I'm giving him a ride and I said, Michael, I got a call today and her mom's friend is going to come to support group, so you should tell her. That will get her excited. And he didn't say anything. He didn't respond to me at all. And so I'm driving along, and I said, Michael, did you hear me? And he said, I heard you. And then he would talk. And I said, Michael, did you, what, what's going on? Your mom's friend's coming. And he still wouldn't say anything. And then finally he said, I felt like a little kid. I felt like he was an old grandpa. He said, pull, pull the car over, and I'll explain. <laughs> and so I pulled it hard at her, and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, okay. And they called me, all of them called me Grandma Faith. They looked at me and he said, Grandma Faith, it's like this. He said, here's how it is. 
people tell you things, and it never is true. They tell you they're going to do this, they're going to do that, and it's never true. So I don't trust that that's going to happen. So, and now listen to this construction that he did to hold himself up. So he said, so if you tell me to tell my mom that her friend is coming, and her mom doesn't come, then she's going to dis get disappointed, and she's going to start drinking. Oh. You know, poor baby, he constructed this whole thing to make it better hypothetically for his mother. Yeah. So he said, why should I disappoint her and set her up for failure? And so he said, you just have to understand this, Grandma Faith. This is how it is. <laughs> and it was, and it was so. Oh, my heart just hurt because he said, people never say what to do what they're saying they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so your daughter probably has that mistrust, and so it it's like you get burned. And so after a while, it's like Michael doesn't believe anymore. And so why should he tell something that he knows that is going to turn into a lie? And so part of that is just continuing to work with yourself and then there's some forgiveness for yourself that needs to happen in your work aside from your daughter. So there are probably some original traumas that you have to grieve yet. So that work is with yourself. It's not about your daughter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Because that's the, and some of you that are addicted, or addicted people, you know that. It's really tough to trust because they never come true. But when the, you know, when the sobriety comes, then they have to learn that all over again. Mm -hmm. So that you're in that process. So don't give up. Okay? Thank you. And we all will be praying for you. Okay. Okay. Let's take about a 10 minute break and then we're going to be closing up here. Thank you for that relationship with their daughters. And they come out there, and some of them are grandmothers. They're doing it with their grandchildren. And so there's a sadness that they didn't have the ceremony, but it creates the healing in that women's ceremony. We have other ceremonies that we're reviving. And I think in an urban area, you have such a richness here that perhaps um, you could come together and do something like that. Mm -hmm. And your challenge, of course, is we try to out Indian each other, right? <laughs> That's one of the challenges of oppression. It's like, my ceremony's better than yours. <laughs> we'll go there to say, you know, how maybe you share it in because you have the California Indians, you have your many tribes here, okay. and maybe um, you're more than welcome to come to ours to experience what happens, and then maybe you can bring it back. Mm -hmm. But we would open that up to you because our girls really need this, and the mothers need it even more. So it, it'll create that healing, and that distance between them. So I wanted to leave that um, with you. We had one of these little every year we have a fresh crop of girls, and they are such outrageous little girls. <laughs> And we've done a um, follow-up looking at what they've done, and the majority of them are waiting to have children at a later date. And they are doing, on the whole, pretty well. And so that four powerful emotional days of ceremony, some of them, that's all we have is about four days. The majority of them will stay connected to us, but some of them will appear out of nowhere. And they said, we came down to pray at the grounds, because that's where we became a woman. And so that's a really, if you read the readings of Ella Deloria in uh, Water Lily, she said that periods of high emotional stress will stay with the person. Trauma is high emotional stress. On the other side, on the positive, ceremonies are high emotions. So those emotional ceremonies are going to cancel out this other stuff. And so that's why we believe so strongly in reviving these women's ceremonies. And I'm sure that if you research in your own tribes, there's lots and lots of ceremonies that we, we essentially have left on by the wayside. So that's part of our history is bringing that back home. Um, we also are doing work with our boys. And uh, we do a hunting camp. We brought uh, lacrosse back. We had a, we've done lacrosse for two years. And this past summer, we had 40 kids at the lacrosse camp, and that's our, our old way of playing. It's called the Little Brother of War in how to resolve conflict. So I just want to leave you with those words, and I am truly honored to be with you in the circle and to hear your stories. My gosh, what what stories of healing. And um, I every time I go somewhere, I learn something. I take your prayers and go into the next community. I'll take your prayers into the Crow Creek community. I'll be there next Tuesday night. So say a prayer for us. <coughs> uh, we had a little uh, precious one that committed suicide. And so the community.
everybody has big feeling around that. And then they have the 38 plus 2 that were hung in Mankato. That's coming up December 26th, 150 <coughs> years. So out of that incident that happened in that community, we're doing a healing circle and then there's a ride, they're riding horseback 300 miles to Mankato. So I'll carry your prayers, your presence, and the memory of your faces to that next gathering on Tuesday night. So just think of me Tuesday night because that's going to be a tough one with the community. But the kids are strong. I went and I talked to the high school. I have the 200 kids there and they are just truly amazing little warriors. I think that they, and you've all been in their shoes in those, those hard times of adolescence. So say a prayer for them too at Crow Creek High School. But thank you, Mary, for having me and whoever else had anything to creating this situation. <laughs> Nobody. But thank you again and you're going to close